We are going live right now, I guess. And I think we're ready to start then. So hi and hello, everyone. Welcome to Keep It Running Startup Solutions for Stable Supply Chains and Safe Manufacturing. I'm Laura from 27 Pilots. I'm excited to be your host for this virtual event today. I hope you are all prepared for this session. Have something good to eat besides. Maybe it's a little too early to have some wine, but who knows? Anyway, so we are going to start the session today with a panel discussion. Um, we are having some inspiring panelists in the meeting today. And afterwards, we're going to hear four startup presentations on solutions in the field of supply chain and manufacturing for the future. Before we jump into the panel discussion, a quick word on how you can participate in today's session. We have created a, a QR code that you can just scan with your phone. It's either on the Eventbrite site or on the slides that we are going to show you right now. Um, you can also go, go to the Slido website and enter our code, keep it running. And then you are free to ask questions to our panelists, but also to the startups that you see in the presentations later on. Please remind to tag everyone you want to ask a question to in your answer. We're going to discuss it in our Q&A session at the end of this event today. So I think that was all from my side for the introduction. I want to hand over the word now to Gregor Gemi, co-founder and managing director of 27 Pilots, and Eugene Kendall, CEO of Startup Nation Central. Yeah, hello from uh, Munich and the 27 Pilots office. Thanks, Laura, for the introduction and welcome everybody to this uh, to this uh, virtual lunch session. Um, yeah, I'm. Gregory, founder and managing director of 27 Pilots. Our company is focused on helping corporations transfer technologies from uh, leading startups so they can gain competitive advantage by applying those solutions uh, within, their, uh, within their companies. And during the SC uh, pandemic started, um, around you know, the beginning of, of, of March this year, we started an initiative uh, which we called the uh, Startups Against Corona. The goal was very, um, you know, very, 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 you know, very obvious, simple to, we wanted to quickly connect corporates um, that had, you know, COVID uh, challenges caused by the pandemic with top startups that had, you know, COVID related solutions. And as you can see in this chart, uh, we um, quickly engaged uh, over 400 startups and over 70 global corporations that were looking out for help from startup companies as obviously one source of, uh, of technology or help. But more interestingly, maybe is this, uh, this number with uh, this, this, this picture in the middle of the slide you're seeing, which is 6.7 billion which basically um, is telling you that the startups that we were targeting to help corporates had a cumulative funding of over 6 billion in venture capital. So they had you know, a substantial amount of capital to put uh, to use to fight, um, uh, to fight problems caused by, uh, by Corona. So in today's session, we want to focus on one of the main issues that were communicated and and uh, and um, and you know sought support for on on startups against Corona, which was um, issues around supply chain. I think what we saw through COVID nineteen, um, it made I think brutally transparent that how how the world really and how the economies all depend on a well functioning supply chain. 
you know, maybe before we were talking about many types of technologies and, you know, supply chain was maybe not the sexiest technology to, uh, you know, to, to discussing about, but now that COVID and the pandemic started, we saw that, you know, how important supply chains are. And, you know, to our surprise, some of the first challenges that companies sought help for on Startups Against Corona were supply chain uh, management and workforce planning uh, for production sites solutions. And, and that was a surprise to us because we thought that, you know, that we were surprised that companies that were facing those challenges couldn't solve them through solutions or technologies from their incumbent partners or incumbent suppliers. So many really turned to, to startups and seek for novel solutions um, so that they can, you know, um, 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 weather better the, the outbreak of this uh, pandemic. This is why we, we, we joined with, um, with a startup nation central out of, out of Israel. And, um, and here's with me its CEO, Eugene Kendall. And we'd like to spend the first minutes of this of this uh, of this um, of this panel talking with Eugene about the ecosystem, startup ecosystem in Israel, and especially why that eco ecosystem is particularly well suited, uh, because they have you know strong solutions, novel solutions uh, for supply chain of uh, of global corporates. Eugene, I hand over to you. Welcome, and thanks for making the time to be with us. Uh, thank you, Gregor and Laura. Thank you for uh, partnering with us. Uh, you're doing a great job, and we are very, very happy to have uh, this uh, collaboration with you. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, good afternoon from the hills overlooking Jerusalem. Uh, we are a non Israeli nonprofit, a Startup Nation Central, which uh, whose goal um, is to A, um, expand and provide, facilitate positive impact of Israeli technological capabilities on the world's most challenging problems, uh, how we can help. And second, we also help Israel to create conditions to, to maintain the uh, being attractive place for this ecosystem to grow and expand. Uh, we we do not charge for anything we do. We do not take money from governments. We are completely 100% uh, donation uh, funded. Uh, it's a particular business model that we chose. By the way, great minds think alike. And so similarly to 27 startups, we also started uh, Corona Tech or Startups Against Corona, a little bit different name. Uh, but also uh, something very, very um, urgent and, and important. And actually, it's been quite successful, uh, although we were not the only ones that were doing this in, in our space. Similarly, um, I think it's very, very timely uh, because one of the things that Corona did is to, um, to actually show that the distributed, vastly distributed and interconnected supply chains around the world they're not a free good. I mean, they are. They have their own risks and challenges, and these challenges have been uh, clearly pointed out by by Corona. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, um, so that's that's who we are. Okay, uh, Eugene, um, given your expertise on the uh, you know Israeli um, startup um, ecosystem. Can you give us some insights specifically into the supply chain area and and how how especially Israeli startups are so competitive and have such you know innovative solutions um, uh, for corporates in this in this area? Uh, of course, uh, in two thousand seventeen, Startup Nation Center was looking for a few um, focus sectors where we could really go deep and and see how we can help. And one of the one of the sectors that somebody suggested was Industry 4.0, including the logistics and the smart manufacturing, all that. And we asked ourselves, why would this be of any relevance to a country which has very very small manufacturing capacity? Yeah. And so, uh, but then so, uh, we realized um, two things. One is that over the last five years, six percent of all the VC funding in this space went to Israel. And so that was surprising because it's a country which basically has no uh, home base. 
in terms of manufacturing. But the second thing that we realized is that if you take the Israeli capabilities that are coming from completely different sources, whether it's big data, whether it's sensors, whether it's AI, cyber, complex optimizations, computer vision, robotics, communications, if you put them together in various combinations, and some of the companies that you will see today will uh, illustrate how you do that, uh, you get a pretty powerful combination that can be applied to Industry 4.0. And so that, that's why Israel is, is actually an interesting place for many corporates to come. And we mm -hmm. started seeing more and more large corporates that we bring to Israel that are specifically interested in this. Some of them are in manufacturing space, but some of them, let's say, from uh, insurance space, because these are issues that exactly um, are focused on maintaining uh, business continuity, maintaining resilience, uh, allowing for 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 much more continuous uh, processes mm -hmm. and those require digitization and so uh, this is what corona brought and now uh, we seeing that uh, many uh, more uh, large corporates see that this is no longer nice to have something they can live without maybe entertain this is something you have to figure out and so okay. that is uh, that is something that we are observing now. There's one other thing that might be worth mentioning is as uh, Bruno Le Maire, uh, the uh, French uh, Minister of Finance and Economics, said in one of our uh, events that he, he said that we are looking for smart self-sufficiency as France. Okay, It's no longer the question of a company deciding on resilience and self-sufficiency. It's the country that decides that it can no longer live with certain critical elements of its economy being dependent on somebody else. And so okay. that shift will require a lot of interesting changes that will be uh, that will be requiring um, adaptation, digitization, optimization, all that sort of other okay. nice things. Eugene, um, before we jump into the panel, uh, I'm very curious about, about, about one thing. What, what do you answer to a CEO when he asks you why should we work uh, with, uh, with, with startups, and especially in light of this pandemic, because what this pandemic is causing to almost everybody is financial strain, <laughs> even to the largest companies, uh, they need to get bailed out by government, and the government is printing money you know, to help the economy, <clears> and now you're saying, hey guys, uh, you should work with startups. Aren't startups the ones who have the least money, and aren't they the most fragile you know, company to work with? Um, wh what do you answer to a CEO about, about this? You know, why startups, and why specifically during this pandemic, where, 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 where it seems to be even riskier to work with startups than before? I think that the answer is quite simple, uh, and it's it's in two pieces. Uh, it actually, well, actually, maybe even three. First of all, the majority of uh, solutions to the problems that any corporate faces, vast majority, will not be found by people working in that corporate. They have to work with somebody else. Yep. A lot of new ideas are coming from startups rather than from established corporations, which has uh, which have le legacy products, legacy, and very difficult to move into really sharply different corners and pivot. So COVID actually brings the need to pivot quickly. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is the capability that startups have and much less large organizations. The mm -hmm. second thing is that for a corporate, working with startup is much easier than working with a large company because startup requires very little to provide solutions. I mean, this is what for startup is a year worth of financing for, for, for a large corporate, it's basically an error in their annual balance sheet. Mm -hmm. and, and the last thing is that today, more than any other time, because of the urgency, because of the needs, and because of the needs for drastically different solutions, if you don't work with startups and your competitor does, you're at a huge disadvantage. So that, mm. that's basically my... Now, the question is, of course, how to work with startups? Which startups know how to work with large corporates? Here, Israelis uh, have, been, uh, have been so accustomed to working with, uh, with the B2B um, model 
and working yeah. remotely with uh, large customers that like the chief innovation officer of Schneider Electric recently said uh, to, to us that working from remote location just became an asset for Israeli startups. It used mm -hmm. to be a liability. Now it's an asset because everybody now works remotely. We just have a lot of expertise in that. Yeah. So, um, so that is that is my answer. You, it okay. used to be nice to have. It's no longer. Yeah, yeah. That's um, um, that's a great summary. Especially the you know, it's easy to work with them because you know one of the main things you always hear is you know the culture difference. And I'm also from my experience at BMW. Um, we are seeing that working with startups is 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 a, is a real pleasure because they are so fast and so motivated and so uh, and and are such deep experts. And we want to add all to those maybe those two points. They have IP, you know, they have protected IP that corporates don't have, you know, because they have invented something, they own the intellectual property to a solution, and they have access to venture capital, which you know a private company doesn't have. And and venture capital is just a very um, also, you know, fast and powerful uh, type of financing innovation that's, you know, something that corporates uh, don't have and, and will never have. And the amounts of, of, of money that a startup brings to the table to solve a specific problem, um, and no corporate can really afford that. Not Apple, not BMW, not Google. And, and, and that's why, you know, they, they work with startups and that's why they acquire startups um, all the time. So, um, I think we're in time for to to start the panel with uh, with uh, two industry representatives who can um, will tell us from their perspective about you know how they're working with startups and specifically in this area of supply chain uh, management. So let's welcome and introduce um, these industry experts. Uh, first is Lars Ressler from Munich. He is the co-founder and venture partner of BSH Startup Kitchen, which is the venture client unit of BSH Home Appliances Group. And he will tell us um, all about what BSH is about and how they are working with startups and what are the benefits and challenges. And we would also like to welcome uh, Giorgio Mauro. Hello. Giorgio Mauro from uh, Paris. He heads up digital operations for supply chain and procurement at a company everybody has probably heard about, Nestle, the world's largest food and uh, beverage company. So is um, Giorgio with us? I can see him on the screen. Is he, is he not? Okay. Giorgio is late. So, Laura, you're the moderator. What do we do? <laughs> well, I'm just here to tell you that Georgia is coming later for the panel. So, okay. um, he's probably he's probably hung up in a supply chain problem. Uh, mm -hmm. Self um, to this panel, anyway. So, um, Laura, should we start and then just you know hold the questions for 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 Georgia later? Yeah. Okay, Lars. So. You, you, you're the star now, correct? So you're awesome. the only one. You have a full spotlight, and um, so tell us about um, a little bit about uh, BSH Home Appliances, which everybody probably has in their homes, a product of yours, but probably few may have heard about the name of the company. Sure. So, and also tell us about um, how you were affected by by the pandemic. And uh, specifically around, you know, what what are what are the measures that you're taking in regards to health of your employees in, in in supply chain in your factories? Sure, happy to do so. And like, first of all, thank you very much for having me in the panel today. Like, even making me the star at least for like maybe five minutes uh, till the rest <laughs> till Georgia joins us. And um, I think that was already like an awesome summary what you two guys already gave you, Gregory and Eugene, why it totally makes sense to partner up with startups to face the current challenges they were facing due to the pandemic, but actually why you should do it in many different spaces, but we'll dive into that. Mm -hmm. um, so coming back to BSH Home Appliances Group, as you were saying, Gregory, I hope every one of you is one of our trusted and happy customers, customers because even though you might not have heard the company name, uh, what it stands for is at Bosch Siemens Home Appliances, and we are one of the leading home appliance manufacturers in the world, actually, actually the largest one in Europe, 
um, mm -hmm. among the top three or top five in the world, depending on how you want to count it by, by turnover, by piece. So what we do, we do awesome products that you should all have in your home. Mm -hmm. And um, so definitely what the very specific situation about the pandemic at the very beginning and actually before, like when I prepared for the panel, it took a while to reconsider how everything, like things happened really, really fast. If you uh, go back in time till March, um, of course, like we had a very singular uh, situation in our Chinese manufacturing capacities, um, uh, which we dealt with, like uh, with uh, the, the, the rigor and the approach that kind of like all companies followed over there. But once the pandemic uh, came over to to Europe to the to the Western world. That was kind of a new situation for us. Mm -hmm. uh, as you can imagine, we are uh, as a home appliance company, we're a consumer goods company. So there are mainly two immediate effects that came to us. Like um, within a couple of weeks, all like we sell a lot of appliances direct mm -hmm. to our consumers, but also through our retail partners. And those shops were closed within a couple mm -hmm. of days. So that's like a huge disruption to our business model, to our supply chain, actually more outbound than inbound. Mm -hmm. And um, the most natural reaction, to be honest, was that we were shutting down our factories within a couple of days or weeks, depending on the location. Of course, you have to manage kind of like a backlog of things you still need to deliver and um, uh, things that need to be compliant with. Uh, but that was kind of like a real tricky challenge to manage that kind of a flexibility in our manufacturing processes because mm -hmm. no one, at least no one that was still working at BSH these days had ever had the situation to close down all factories yep. in Europe within a couple of weeks, unheard of. And we hope we don't see that coming again. But um, then we took that time or like the, the colleagues took the time uh, in, in the manufacturing um, capacities and factories to think about how to slowly restart everything and mm -hmm. in in a very safe place for our um, uh, workers. And to be very honest, like the very first steps were rather manually driven, like yep. wearing masks, keeping distance, some organ you would call it organizational matters. Mm -hmm. And we are right now in the process of actually seeing how we can bring this to the new normal. Because I mean, if you're all following the press, so it's not yep. just like a singular event we had in. Uh, March and April, and now we're done. No, it's something we have to live with. And just heard uh, from actually not only from BS BSH, but also many other um, uh, industry players that workers yeah. in the factory are complaining they cannot stand working with a ma wearing a, a mask at high temperatures for eight yeah. hours. That's something we're currently heavily looking into. And um, so there's a huge demand for tech solutions rather than pure organizational measures. Um, okay, you 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 mentioned at the beginning also the the issue with uh, with the point of sale, correct? And you're you're in a strange situation because everybody's staying at home now during the three months, and everybody wants to cook, and they want a better kitchen, and they want better home appliances. But then the stores are closed, correct? So they can't go and buy yeah. it. Yeah. So it's like, hmm. so yeah. how do you deal with uh, how did you deal with uh, that 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 risk, and how you also you know. Also, looking into you know stores are open now, but they may close down any time. Correct, if hotspots um, you know occur suddenly, mm. how are you exploring uh, um, you know new uh, new solutions for point of sales, and, and and what's what's the role of startups in 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 that matter? Mm. I, I think there are like two aspects to it. Like first of all, like we certainly need to uh, prepare ourselves for higher fluctuation or volatility when it comes to demand, which will yep. we will need to translate to higher flexibility on our manufacturing side because like yep. one from one day to the other we need to be able to adjust our manufacturing capacities and also maybe that, that's something i haven't for, i forgot to mention you need to yep. manage how to communicate with your factory workers that don't have a cell phone that typically are mm -hmm. not like locked into your systems every day so this is certainly an area where we're looking into technological solutions some internally Mm. We're very happy to can have the ability to reach out to our even like blue collar workers we call them in the factories even though they're not in the in the factory so that's really good, but as you're saying with the point of sale, I mean um, as you are as you were already uh, explaining we're working with partners and we 
we are very happy to work with them. Okay. And we're currently looking uh, together with these partners in solutions on how to manage um, that kind of like volatility when it comes to physical retail space. So what mm -hmm. happens if the shops lock down? But I think that's the trend you see everywhere. Everyone is moving to um, online sales opportunities could be yeah. for us direct to consumer or like using marketplaces to reach out to consumers. And as you were saying, like one thing we observed in the market at the very beginning, I mean, people were more, more concerned about their health and not worrying about getting like refurbishing their home. Yeah. Um, we saw a huge spike in small domestic appliances. So blenders, mixers, coffee machines, they saw like a kind of like very understandable uh, um, extra demand. Yep. Uh, but on the other side, now, as things go back to normal, actually consumer spending also tends to go back to normal. At least we're very happy to see that in, in, our, um, mm -hmm. in our business development. We need to explore new ways to sell kitchens to our uh, consumers, which will then, of course, be digital. Like you, if you're not able to go to a shop, um, there, there are many opportunities like giving you like a better product explanation. Like right now, when you look into many, um, when you want to buy a new home appliance, it's very technical. Okay. That's not mm -hmm. very consumer friendly because that's why you have a retail shop and the, the, the shop assistant will explain you the details. That's got to be more user friendly. Um, you need more assistance for the planning. You get need, okay. need to have more assistance on how uh, the requirements that you have a person or a family fits to the product that you want to buy. So these are certainly areas we will need to um, add on the regular um, D2C or digital uh, sales uh, mode okay. so far. So um, Eugene and all the uh, Israeli VCs, you're listening very, very deeply, you know, very sharply what, what Lars is saying, because that's where we need help also from startups. And good news is that we have a Giorgio now uh, a part of the panel. Welcome, Giorgio. Hello, everybody. Sorry for the lady. Um, thanks for introducing me. Um, yeah, George, we're excited about your participa participation, especially because you're a great fit to this panel because you provide all the food that goes into a fridge of BSH. So, um, <laughs> and then being cooked and, and so on. So, um, but without further ado, um, we, are, we are a little bit short on time. We have about eight minutes. But um, tell us, tell us about supply chain in uh, in in the consumer markets. Um, we all know that restaurants and bars had had to close, and you are you are a large supplier and definitely also dependent on just in time. You know, supply chain. H how did how did uh, how did this pandemic affect you? What what are what are the main what are the main issues? Yes, uh, thanks a lot to Gregor. Uh, uh, let's say that. Uh, from the Nestle standpoint, uh, as we are largely operating in many different countries around the world, we had the chance to uh, uh, having a little bit in advance of what was going on in other areas before being affected here in Zona Mena, uh, which in includes uh, Israel as well. So the, the main things we, we faced too, that's uh, the, the COVID in a way made somewhere and an end and the taste wins uh, depending on the business. And in particular for those which are uh, uh, delivering the, the Eureka channels, which are mostly waters or Nestle professionals, but also in a way the confession in part, we have been hardly impacted. On the other end, the other, the other business was, was not. And one of the key things that helped us in a way to, to overcome the situation is not only ever having a, a larger, broader uh, portfolio, but also leveraging the technologies. Okay. The technologies allow us to make a clear vision of where the, our trucks were, uh, were stacked not only for the delivery part, but also for the incoming raw materials, which led mm -hmm. in a way also to manage our, our production site and being able also to deliver uh, where we had this huge increase in, in food industries in somewhere and in a way to slow down our productions for those businesses hardly affected. So we had a real, a real advantages seeing what was going on into the trucks to understand about true analytics where mm -hmm. we had to invest or where we have not to put the resources. Okay. Um, so we have about five minutes left. And uh, thanks for those insights. I, I would like to ask one question to both of you. And um, 
and the same same question. So could you name one startup and its technology and the problem it has solved in the last month that was um, that helped with your with your supply chain? If you can if you can talk about such a project it would be great. If you don't have an example, I would mm. love you to answer the questions how you during these times answer to your CEO the question about about why startups are relevant during during that time. So either or, I would prefer um, the, the, the first question, if you can talk about it, so a name of a startup and a specific problem they solved and, and why that startup really was, 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 was so important, or if not the second, you know, justifying the need for this resource called external startup mm -hmm. to, uh, to remain competitive. Who wants sure. to start? I can start, if that's okay. Yep, go ahead. Perfect. Um, I mean, maybe like I'm, I'm very happy to answer the question with like giving an example um, for a startup that we worked with. It's not too much like supply chain related, but rather industry 4.0 or manufacturing related. Okay. And maybe one thing to, 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 to stress again, I think we will not only see like demand in uh, changing the way we work, but also to be a bit more efficient. I mean, right now, I think every company has the pressure or the need to uh, streamline and optimize operations. I think that's a, uh, there are, we have an example uh, with a startup which is called Inspecto, uh, mm -hmm. which by chance, and actually by chance, it's an Israeli startup. They actually do a lot of business with the German automotive manufacturing um, players. And what they developed is a system or a tool that helps you to automate optical inspection in a very, very simple and actually very cheap um, way. So they help us to reduce a lot of manual labor within mm -hmm. our, you know, in, within our manufacturing, manufacturing lines, but it's not really about like lab, labor reduction. It's not only like getting rid of the workforce, that's not the point, but they do at a much higher uh, level of quality so we can improve yield and reduce uh, scrap costs. So like they, you, you can use them, for example, uh, to easily train, like, in, in find production errors you know, mm -hmm. when, when they happen, right? And then you can sort out the wrong part and you can go on. It's pretty stupid if you find, like, uh, five manufacturing process steps later that that, that was a bad part. Yeah. And this is something that worked very well. Um, something, I think, Eugene, you were referring to that. This is something internal colleagues had been looking into but it's outside of what our capacities naturally are. Mm -hmm. And this is where the power and the beauty of working together with startups comes into place, right? So they bring in expertise, speed, know-how, and funding, Gregory, that was your point, mm -hmm. that we could never invest. And they have something kind of like off the shelf that is ready to use and solving the problem before we, as a corporate, like we, we, we like to think we're fast, but... When you look at the speed of startups, we're we're not, okay. and that's the beauty. Like bringing these uh, two worlds together for a very very concrete use case like this. Yeah. Great, yeah. We we uh, inspectors is a great example, and I can speak from my experience in automotive industry. And um, you know, using inspector, you can save in your factories upwards of you know, depending on the size of your factory, two million or more per year. So um, if you today go to your CEO and say, I have technology here that can save us two million a year per year per factory, then you probably, he will probably listen. Yeah. So um, Giorgio, do you have an example of a startup that uh, you know is saving the neck of Netflix? Yeah, yeah, I have a few ones. And let's say that's, uh, I, I honestly don't know if we can still call them startups in, 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 the, real, uh, okay. in the real meaning. But anyway, we, uh, we, we strongly believe that startups can bring a lot of things to the corporate. And mm -hmm. I will be back uh, in a few seconds with this. But uh, during the COVID situation, the ones that's really um, so saved our lives, the ones that were the ones who leveraged the data uh, in the, what I was referring before, the trucks data and the truck deliveries. So we used one which is uh, named Six Folds, which gave us the transit time for, uh, at the cross border within the European Union. Because thanks to that, also we had uh, the uh, the capability and the ability to manage the European Community uh, okay. authorities in order to be able them to to open uh, the the borders between uh, uh, between the different countries and enable us to maintain 
our production and in a way food uh, food uh, of our of our populations we do mm -hmm. have also have another ones which is a, a roughly data related which is quad mines which is a startup spain based in which mm -hmm. we are using uh, currently uh, to optimize our uh, salesforce team uh, path during the different visit within the different uh, um, retail stores uh, which is let's say between sales and and logistics because at the end of the day yeah. is optimization of this system and we do have uh, some uh, some uh, good experience with with one of your uh, israeli based startups of SIBO, also in the mm -hmm. manufacturing uh, standpoint, which you might have known. And as we we believe that uh, uh, startups can bring a lot of things to the to the Nestle uh, corporate, uh, if, um, we, we decide also to invest a little bit in Israel. Okay. So we, in a couple of, of weeks, uh, you might be uh, leading to uh, the official launch of what we, we will call the Tel Aviv Innovation Outpost. So Israel will uh, will being uh, really one of the of the things in which uh, we would like to, to leverage, and uh, I think that the the people there, the Nestle represented there, will be more than happy to get in touch with you, all of you guys, and uh, yeah. because uh, the 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 startup nations uh, will be a key point to contact point to to make it this happen. Yeah, Giorgio, thanks a lot, and uh, that's great news, and. Um... We also hope to be announcing, uh, hopefully, the, the first uh, Nestle Venture Client Unit, correct? Maybe at some point? At a certain um, point, yes. Yeah, just, just to give you guys, folks, a number, the, the amount of startups that could be transferred into BMW with a, with a Venture Client Unit was increased by a factor of 10. So, um, and it reduced the cost, maybe measured in time, from somewhere around 20-something months to way below uh, six months to actually achieve a transfer and a transfer, what we mean by that is, you know, using a technology within BMW from, from a startup. So, um, so I think this could be a great addition to whatever you're doing in Israel because that'll funnel many more startups into the corporate uh, wherever, wherever the uh, wherever, wherever the user of, of, of a startup technology is. So, it's 42 now, 12.42, so I'd like to hand over to the real, real stars of this uh, panel, which are which are uh, the startups. Thanks to uh, Lars. Um, let's hand over to, to Laura now. All right, can you hear me now? <laughs> Thank you, Gregor, Eugene, Lars, and Giorgio for this interesting discussion. I think it's a perfect bridge for our, our startup presentations right now. Before we jump into the first presentation, I want to engage you or, or remind you again to use our Slido page to, uh, to ask questions to the panelists, but also to the startups later on. We have time enough to, to discuss them after the presentations. We're going to start with the first presentation of the startup Contguard. Uh, Contguard is a startup developing an AI-based solution that enables big corporate clients to track and monitor cargo and shipments from origin to destination. And I want to hand over the word now to Lita, the co-founder and CEO of Contguard. Thank you, Laura. Hi, everybody. Let me just share my screen. Um, and uh, thank you all for joining us on this special webinar today. Um, just Laura, can you see my screen? Is it okay? Yes. Great. All right. So my name is Iftah Nativ. I'm the CEO and co-founder at Congard. And first, I would like to take this opportunity and to thank Talia and all the team from Startup Nation. That the, when they contacted us a few weeks ago, I was so happy because we all have to spread out the message that what we call the new cargo, the new normal in cargo security will stay with us, not less than a year ahead. And we all should be uh, prepared for ourselves, you know, to this situation, which um, we all know that COVID-19 is not like any other threat that we all seen in the last days, decades. And this invisible enemy has changed our lives completely and also our business activities. Um, and uh, we all know that eventually we'll go, uh, we'll get through this, but you know, the upcoming, wave, the upcoming waves are waiting for us behind the corner. 
A um, few weeks ago, actually, I published two posts predicting that a layoff could uh, lead to an increase in cargo crime as people commit more property crimes during mass layoffs. Uh, the economic pressure, lack of uh, a weekday routine uh, are the main key driver for uh, what we're calling crime for profit. And by the way, it doesn't happen only in the United States. We see uh, cargo looted all around the world. It happened in South Africa, Mexico, Italy, and many other countries. And there is another threat, you know, to cargo crime. I think you all, we are all wearing it, you know. And this is something that also increases um, this uh, issue. Um, when shipping goods from A to B, things don't always go as planned. Uh, during the last 20 years, uh, companies invested millions of dollars to better manage their facilities with the most advanced technologies, just of time production, and so on. But nothing really happened to managing cargo in transit. 70% of the world cargo uh, world goods are in transit in any given moment with almost zero control and visibility. Um, according to the last report published by the FBI in 2016, based on voluntary data, uh, they estimate that the annual direct losses for cargo is close to 55 billion. By the way, we believe that those numbers are much higher. And uh, the indirect losses uh, that usually companies prefer not to add them to their financial reports are about four to five times higher. Um, we also see an increase in cargo crime according to the top organization, which we are part of it, that in 2019 compared to previous year, uh, 115, and in this year, they see that this increase is continuous. Um, the main need that we see in the market right now is actually related to the three main bullets you see above here. Um, we see that there are a lot of abnormalities uh, for supply chain issues that cause a lot of a supply chain a procedures and inefficient activities. Uh, in addition, as I mentioned, a risk issues, which is a theft, but we also see that cargo quality, which is more for a damage for caused by humidity, temperature, and so on. And unreliable ETAs, I can tell you that since we started this pandemic and also before, most of our clients are uh, have delays to the markets. We have a way how to predict ETAs all along the route from starting to end. And we see that there is a major increase in delays to the markets. All right, I'm sorry, something happened. Can you see my screen? Lava, can you see me? Hello? Yeah. Um, Laura, can you see me? It's okay. Um, in addition, we also see that um, uh, companies need to prefer and prepare contingency planning according to the situation we have around the world right now. Um, I'm sorry, uh, there's something, let me just stop. Uh, Laura, can you hear me or see me? No. no. Yes? Because something is wrong here, but let me continue. Um, some tech issues. Okay. I'm sorry. I can hear you and I can see you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I had some, something, had, something, I had some tech yeah. issues, but I'm, I'm, I'm here. One minute. I'm clearing it again. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about uh, what our solution and clients that are working with us because actually we are running after time. So our solution is unique in its domain. We offer the entire value chain uh, for tracking and analyzing goods in transit. We operate fit of purpose IoT devices that attach to the goods at the place of loading and detach them at the end of the routes. We have a network of affiliates that support these activities and operate 24-7 command and control to prevent and predict about losses. Our customers get access to two SaaS models. One of them is tracking shipments in life and provide predict ETAs and uh, alert about anomalies. And the other one is uh, analyzing post-shipment analytics, uh, post-shipment activities, uh, mainly uh, aggregating data and help our client to understand whether risk happens and how to reduce it. 
Um, we serve clients from seven different verticals. Uh, I'm running out of time, but the main uh, clients are big firms, uh, the owner of the goods, um, which send, that sends high value um, um, and high volume goods. The data we, we, we analyze um, has two main um, uh, features or um, includes the, the locations of the goods and the ETAs, as I say, uh, goods, quality conditions, humidity, temperature impacts, and good security conditions, uh, un unauthorized opening in places, and debate from specific routes, and so on. Um, this is an example how the dashboard is looking like. So this client, for example, is shipping goods uh, to Japan. Um, we got an uh, alert for delay. The clients will get it before the shipment ended. He knows that this shipment, for example, is expected to be delayed by six days and prepare himself to, um, you know, to the markets and inform his client of whatever needed. And as I say, the post-shipment analytics aggregate a lot of data and provide a, a very in a very clear way how my supply chain is actually looking both from the logistic press perspective and, and the risk perspective. Uh, benefits for clients. Um, so um, customers typically come to us with uh, one or more of the three needs above here, so it can be related to inefficient su supply chain um, um, issues, uh, security and quality. Uh, but there is much more to it, as shown, uh, this is only the tip of the iceberg. We can help customer service to be a better customer to their, a uh, better supplier to their clients, a uh, reduced transit time, a uh, better risk, uh, to, to help to, to uh, reduce risk. And the bottom line is to help our clients uh, to grow. Perfect. So, I think we have to take a look at the time. Um, Thank you. Do you have any a lot of more slides? Otherwise, I think no, we got just, uh, two more. So I just want to mention that we maintain a very strong ecosystem from the insurance activities. Um, they, our partners already gave uh, are giving benefits to clients who work with us. It can be related to lower deductibles or discounts on the premiums. Um, and that's it more or less. So thank you, everybody. Perfect. Thank you so much for the insights. I think we got a pretty good idea on why this is a really, really relevant and helpful solution to, to corporates. I think uh, because of we're running out of time, I would just go on to our next presentation. I want to, to introduce you all to Jonathan. He's Vice President of Sales of 3D Signals. It's a startup that provides a solution to digitize machines on the shop floor. Jonathan, the stage is yours. Hi, hi. hi everybody. Uh, let me just share my screen. Where is it? This one. The entire screen. Share. Can you see me? Yes. Perfect. You can you see my presentation? Yes. Good. So hi, everybody. I'll try to be quick and short, uh, like uh, we are as a company, be focused. So thank you for inviting me. Uh, we are basically at the start of the supply chain system. We operate with the manufacturers. And what we do is we connect uh, production floors and, and, and factories to the digital world. And so we provide business insights to top management. So this is who we are. The company is about uh, almost uh, five years old. Up until now, we raised about $26 million. We have patents around digital um, signal processing and acoustic uh, um, analyze, uh, analysis. We just won the Red Herring Award for, uh, for the top 100 um, startups. We are a member of the Open Industry Four Alliance, um, and we are backed by two Israeli venture capitals and two German venture capitals. So what's the challenge? The challenge is when you have managers uh, that are stuck at uh, their countries or even at home, and they have to take decisions. And the problem is that you don't have data. Um, so if you want to, to control your business and you want to make uh, wise decisions, you have to be uh, it has to be based on data. So 
uh, we provide this type of data. The next challenge is even in spite of your current country situation, other countries are maybe open and the, and the competition continues. So if you are a manager that is based in Europe and you have uh, uh, multiple factories, um, nobody cares if you, if you are in lockdown. So the competition is there and you have to be more efficient. So if you want to protect your assets and you want to uh, uh, even take over certain markets, you have to be very efficient. And then um, you need to have access to all the data and all the factories, all the, all the information that is out there in order to, to be in control. And one statement I would say here is that this pandemic is uh, creating a situation where the small or the, or the weak companies will disappear or will suffer a major loss. And those who will take the opportunity of uh, connecting and getting uh, uh, more data and better insights of their business may emerge to be giants. So this is an opportunity, not only a risk. So how do we do this magic? We uh, provide, basically we connect a device to a manufacturing machine uh, with different type of sensors. Um, we start gathering the data from the machine and then we upload it to the cloud. And then very quickly, our customers start getting um, um, live view and dashboards over the production floor. It doesn't matter if they're sitting at home, they can see everything from the tablet or from the mobile. Um, so it's a cloud-based solution. And very quickly, within a few weeks, you will start getting BI information so you can analyze and, and basically take actionable decisions uh, based on the data that you uh, have from your factory. So this process is really fast. It's speeding light. Um, so in connection, it takes about 45 minutes to connect the machine. And then within a few weeks, you will have all the data from your digitalized factory. And that's a statement that we really like. If you can measure it, you can improve it. And this is, that's an example in a factory in, in Germany, where we put a big screen all over the production floor. And now everybody sees everything. So the entire organization is based on the same data and, uh, and is able to um, align the production. So to summarize this part, our solution is a plug and play. So the customer doesn't need to do anything except for internet access and electricity. The results come very, very fast. One of our main uh, strengths is, uh, is uh, the ability to connect very old machines with new machines, which is a huge challenge to manufacturers because you have a hybrid and heterogeneous uh, um, environment when you go to a factory and we can do all of it and put all the production uh, machines on the same platform. We, we use uh, uh, external sensors, so we don't rely on the data that's coming straight from the machine controller. So our solution is kind of uh, outside of the box thinking and it's very, uh, very accurate. And since we don't connect to the machine controller, uh, it's very safe. So there's no risk of breaching into the uh, manufacturing itself, just getting the data out. Um, our uh, solution is cloud-based, so the more insights and the more data we collect from the factory, the better the insights are for the customer. And obviously, we release new updates every two weeks or so, and then the value for the customer is growing. Um, looking at the same uh, situation from the ERP point of view, we know the ERP companies are, or solutions are very good in uh, many, many things. However, the manufacturing uh, platform is like a black box for them. So we have integration with uh, several ERP system like SAP, for example, and we provide real-time data into the uh, uh, ERP system. So that's, um, that's another advantage. Uh, Samsung AG is a German company, around 600 million uh, revenue, about 4,000 employees, 18 factories around the world. Uh, we're connected in five factories, over 100 machines, and we use everybody uh, and we serve everybody in the organization from the uh, uh, top management, the CEO, all the way down to the operators. And that's an example of uh, improvement when on the left, you would see an early adopter flow manager we accepted or um, started using the system very efficiently from the start. And he managed to improve his business and the availability of the entire floor very nicely. And then a few months later, the entire organization followed 
and now they are improving uh, their production for almost 50% more. Um, same thing happened when uh, using our tool to optimize the production and they managed to basically uh, optimize and cancel uh, temporary operators and, and contractors for the third shift. So not only producing more, but also protecting their core assets uh, from the factory, especially in this uh, period of time. Another thing that uh, we allow our customers is to look at energy saving and consumption. So they, are, they were able within a year to save 14% on their energy consumption. This is a situation where we see the pandemic effect. Um, this is a, a production behavior of a factory, and then we see the social distancing implementation in the factory. So if you are the manager of the factory and you want to uh, look at your business while you are not there, you're able to see how the, uh, the uh, factories themselves behave according to uh, um, according to the regulations. Another important thing that we've seen is that factories that use the right data and the right insights are increasing their business in spite of the pandemic situation. So if you're not panicking and if you're using the data correctly, you will be able to increase your business and not, uh, uh, not suffer major loss. That's it. Perfect. Thank you so much, Jonathan, for the, for the presentation and all the insights. I think we received one or two questions. We are going to move them to the Q&A session in the end. Um, for the next presentation, we have Jaron, founder and CD CEO of Mobideo. It's a platform that digitalizes the industrial workforce. Jaron, please go ahead. Thanks, Lara. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure uh, meeting you all uh, virtually. Uh, let me share my screen with you. Can, we, can you see my desktop? Now I can see it, yes. Fantastic. So um, I was listening to the panel, uh, and, and the panelists speak about you know, Industry 4.0 and what it is, specifically in times of pandemic. And if I try to summarize what Industry 4.0 is in one world, I would say it's about connectivity. Industry 4.0 is all about uh, connecting things in order to streamline processes, streamline operations, and work more efficiently. And while other companies are focused on uh, digitalizing or connecting physical assets, we are focused on connecting what we believe is the biggest asset of any industrial company, and those are people, whether they are uh, direct employees or contractors. So we focused on connecting people to the information they need, connecting people to one another, and connecting people to managers so that managers can get their visibility. Uh, what, what I'm sharing here is a classic, uh, you know, uh, situation that we see with our customers. Uh, so we serve very, very large multinational customers in many plants and many facilities, customers like Dow, like uh, Chevron Phillips, like Coke Industries, mainly in very asset-intensive industries such as power, uh, utilities, oil and gas, petrochemical, uh, aviation, marine and others. So what you see in this picture is a classic example of a gas turbine which is being overhauled, and we can see a teamwork which is being performed by a bunch of uh, guys that work together in a very, very collaborative way. They're working in a very harsh environment and obviously, uh, every work, every activity that needs to be done here has to be done according to very, very strict procedures uh, with full adherence to uh, guidelines and to know-how. Otherwise, either this turbine will not get back to production on time or something bad can happen, such as somebody chopping his hand or this whole thing catching fire. So this, this is basically the environment that we're dealing with. And obviously, uh, this picture illustrates not only the challenges as it relates to productivity in a non-COVID-19 world, obviously it you know, magnifies the challenge of working in a COVID-19 world where people have to work in a collaborative way. And that's, that's basically a, a, an example of the situations or the challenges that we are designed and built to focus. 
So what we have developed is what we call the uh, Connected Workforce Platform. Uh, the Connected Workforce Platform is a framework. It's a backbone framework that connects people to the information that they need, connects people to one another. And it's built out of uh, three different applications. The first one is what you see on the left. This is a Connected Worker. So the Connected Worker is a custom personalized application that enables every uh, worker, whether he's an employee or a contractor, to easily access all the information he needs from various data sources. The application is unique in its ability to synthesize the data, to provide it to the user in the context of his job. And obviously, in kind of non-COVID-19 uh, world, we're talking about a lot of significant productivity gains, such as uh, finishing the job on time, such as ensuring adherence, such as increasing productivity. But when you're looking at a COVID-19 world, on top of that, there are additional benefits such as minimizing the time on site and minimizing communication with peers and obviously communicating with the data in a paperless way that avoids an, an, a people interaction and, and creates social distancing. Uh, the second application is what we call the Connected Manager. And this is a control center that provides managers with real-time detailed visibility into what large teams are doing in the field. So typically in the industrial world, managers do not have line of sight to what people are doing uh, remotely. And this is a control center that enables managers to understand what's going on, who's doing what, how is the work progressing compared compare to the plan, compared to KPIs, compared to risks, and the value, again, in a non-COVID world relates to better decision-making, relates to uh, resource allocation, relates to the ability to make decisions based on real-time granular validated data. If you take that to a COVID-19 world, then the benefits are even greater because here are you, now you're talking about managers that do not have to be close to their employees. Uh, not only that managers can, uh, uh, you know, uh, facilitate remote supervision, we also have the ability to take older subject matter experts who are more sensitive to the uh, uh, pandemic, put them remotely and enabling them to support younger guys who are at the point of service. So again, very, very unique benefits in a normal world, which are even magnified in a COVID-19 world. And the last application is what we call the process optimization, which is an optimizer that enables not only to understand processes in real time, but actually to look after the fact at activities that have been completed, identify trends, identify patterns, and use the data which is captured uh, in the platform in order to drive continuous process improvement. Uh, so again, many, many benefits in, uh, in a non-COVID world, but COVID uh, even magnified that, and that enables us to provide what we call a pandemic resilient workforce environment. Now, one of the things I want to highlight is the fact that when you look at a owner operator's digital landscape, when you look at large multinational companies, so they have already invested in plenty of uh, uh, backbone systems to manage supply chain and engineering and assets and manufacturing and projects. And Vora, those are mature, saturated markets. When it comes to how companies in the industrial world are managing their people, we're looking at very, very primitive, I would say, ways of working using documents, forms, mobile phones, and walkie-talkies. And basically what we focus on is in taking this a very critical part, digitalizing it, and by doing so, we provide a lot of value and we complete uh, the puzzle, uh, which, which is very, very critical for industrial companies. Mm -hmm. uh, I won't get too technical, but I'll just say in you know, one sentence, we do that by a very, very uh, sophisticated platform that connects data sources on the left, IT systems, OT systems, and a lot of non-structured documentation with uh, workers, with managers, basically streamlines the entire communication. And it's a platform in its ability to integrate and exchange data with existing data sources, but also with the ability to support very, very large volumes of activities 
uh, in many industries and in many, many use cases. So if you look at a continuous process plan, for example, activities such as construction, commissioning, installation, preventive maintenance, connective, uh, 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 um, um, corrective maintenance, shutdowns, turnarounds, all of those activities are managed in a single platform. And one of the benefits our customers are seeing is the ability to uh, you know, use one backbone, one framework, our platform to manage many, many use cases. And this is something which is critical because nowadays, as part of the digitalization, uh, we see a very strong motivation to basically minimize the number of uh, systems which are being used and to focus on few platforms. And that's, that's what we do. You see some of our customers here, very large multinational customers that we support in digitalizing their uh, workforce. So that was a brief introduction. You're more than welcome to uh, uh, log into our website and uh, learn more or contact me on my team anytime. Great. Thank, Thank you very much, Lawa. Thank you, Yaron. Thank you for the presentation and, and for all the information. On your company. So we have one more presentation to come. I want to welcome Dror. He's the director of sales of Precognize, a predictive analytics solution for the industry. Hi everyone, Laura, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Wonderful. So uh, best for last. No, I'm, I'm joking. Uh, everyone, uh, very well. So first of all, I'll say that uh, again, thank you very much uh, for inviting us and uh, for all the participants for uh, listening to, to me. Uh, I do want to start by saying that we are a bit fortunate because we were acquired by Samsung AG, uh, the use case that Jonathan uh, presented earlier. So uh, Samsung AG acquired us, uh, we are fully owned by Samsung, uh, but in the same sense, uh, we are very lucky because we are still a standalone entity. Uh, we're independent in the entity, so we are basically combining, a, if you remember the discussion that uh, Grego and Eugene had in the first um, slot, talking mm -hmm. about how startups coming in together with uh, or fighting the pandemics and the next crisis, mm -hmm. so we are kind of fortunate because on one side, we are still a startup, very agile, very fast, that speedboard that goes anywhere and how we're, and can go in any path that they, they need to. Mm -hmm. And on the other side, we have a really big uh, company behind us that support us. So as uh, I'll, I'll put a bit more about Samsung than what Jonathan mentioned. So Samsung has more than 113 years experience within the process industries, 4,500 employees. And basically what, what has been done uh, through uh, Samsung acquiring us is a really nice combination when a uh, tradition a tradition German company meets innovation, a startup Israeli company. And um, this is where SoundGuard uh, basically come into place. Uh, what we like to say, even though I'm a bit biased, that we, we actually have, we have amazing technology. And we're doing that by um, combining it with, uh, with humans' uh, knowledge and information. A lot of people are afraid that AI will come or machine learning will come and will replace people. We're doing the opposite. We're basically taking the knowledge and getting uh, our users to be even better uh, by using our software. It's not here to replace them. Now, we are very focused. We're working only within the process industries. So uh, chemical, petrochemicals, refineries, oil and gas, pulp and paper, so on and so forth. Um, really looking forward to start a project in food and beverage. So if somebody mm -hmm. in the audience is looking forward, we'll be more than happy to start the first project there. And um, we are very happy to say that we are not testing our solution. Uh, we have well-finished product. We're working from North, South America, Europe, Russia, Israel, of course, and also in the east part of the world. And what we do, uh, from when we, let me just start by saying that uh, when we started, everybody was talking about predictive maintenance. Uh, even though it's still big buzzword, we know that there's much more money in more production. So we shift our focus to make sure that our customers will produce more product, which of course that the part of maintenance is part of the, of the production area. And then we ask ourselves where we can help our focus within the process industry to increase production is within those unforeseen events, events that basically never happened or happened five years ago, one time, those things that keep surprising you over and over and over. Mm -hmm. 
And then we ask if there's money in that area. And we notice that there's, yes, there's a lot of money hidden in those uh, business as usual, normal operation that we are already ex 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 accepting as normal operation. This is a very short example of one of our customers, eight alerts, and we asked them to quantify what, will be, what could have happened if we were not there alerting in advance. Um, and you see that the, the, the range is quite high because uh, replacing a sensor can cost you a few hundreds or a few thousands of dollars. But if the sensor goes down and you are blind and you don't know exactly what's the reading, and then the compressor failed or the reactor failed, and then you're losing production, it can go for hundreds if not millions because a day of production costs enormous amount of money. And this is also coming into place with with COVID-19 when when you're able to plan ahead and to fix ahead when you don't have the en enough maintenance people at the facility as you usually do when you're dealing things with that that small before you're actually getting the alert and the control room, and it's already too late when you're fixing things when they are small mm -hmm. you will reduce the energies the time consuming from the team at the plant before it's too late and, and but in order to that to do so to be able to reduce the pressure in the control room uh, and to get to those numbers you must cover the entire plant and this is one of our biggest advantages we're not looking about specific processes specific equipments we're looking about uh, static equipment rotating equipment any type of process because nobody knows where the next issue challenge failure problem will come within the installation and what's nice about everything in the industry that we are working with is that the data is already here. So the, the, our customers are already co collecting the data. They store it in any type of historian. And what we are saying is you have problems, you have issues, you have challenges, failures, sh unexpected shutdowns, and you have data. So upload the data that you already own to any server and any location that you decide so there's no any cyber security breaches or issues whatsoever and the software will analyze that information and will tell you in advance where the next issue is going to come from now i don't have time to go into all the technology the technology and what makes us really special but i try to really summarize it with this slide everybody today is talking about machine learning uh and especially in industry 4.0 unfortunately that um Unsupervised machine learning, I won't even go to supervised machine learning because it cannot really work in the process industry. Uh, but unsupervised machine learning, uh, as good as it is, which is amazing, there's one challenge. It creates a lot of noise because at the facility you have thousands of tags. It have tens of thousands of tags, sometimes even more than 150,000 tags. And every anomaly will basically create an alarm. But 98% of them are not an issue, and everybody knows that. And this is the biggest challenge of unsupervised machine learning by itself. It creates a lot of noise. So what I like to say is that this is what everybody is doing. Uh, everybody takes historical data, and everybody will run them through the machine learning uh, baseline models. And then when the online data will come in, the outcome is a lot of noise, a lot of false alarms. And the way that we challenge it is we're creating a special uh, model of the plant together with the process of the plant to tell you exactly where the next issue is going to come from. So we have a patent to this, uh, to this part over here. It will basically able to reduce the noise and only thing that is not important to let, not even let you know about it and showing you only what is important. And we are so accurate and we are so pinpointed that in a plant, we are defining a plant in an area of 10,000 historian tags, but in that side, which is quite big, it's like two, three units in a chemical plant, we're providing an average of only five alerts a day. That's it. Only what's important, only what's matter, only what actually is developing before you're actually getting the problem or the failure or the issue. Uh, I'll summarize everything by saying a few points, five points. One thing, uh, we covered the entire plant which I don't think anybody else can, uh, but we do that because nobody knows where the next issue is going to come from. Uh, we don't provide noise. Uh, we're providing an average of only five alerts a day for the entire installation. We are very focused about detecting the unexpected issues, so unexpected failures, process deviations, blockages, overflow, those things that happens almost on a daily basis, if not on a weekly basis, that keeps 
finding it with a big surprise, and you now need to start running and fixing that and losing hours of operation and production would cost you hundreds of thousands, if not millions. Uh, you don't need a special expert uh, or to hire somebody to look at our system. The plant operational people, the process engineers, and the guys from the control room are the ones that are using the software, which is really nice because it's there's no any additional investment. And going to this, you don't need to buy new sensors, no new hardware. We are using the data that you're already collecting, which is 99% of the company that I meet, it's enough. And what's nice about that, it, it takes us a week or two to implement. So think about an area of 10,000 historian tags. In two weeks, you're up and running. We are monitoring and telling you exactly or before any unexpected issue is going to come from. So we are that fast, we are super accurate, and we are very large. So scaling is not a problem at all. So thank you very much. Uh, and I hope that I stay with my five minutes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you a lot for the presentation. Uh, it was great, great to hear. Um, I think since we started a little late and we're running out of time and a lot of you, of you have probably to leave for next meetings. Um, we decided to move the Q&A session from this personal session to a survey afterwards. So first of all, thank you all so much for participating in the session today. Thank you to all the panelists to be here and for your insights. Of course, thank you to all the startups for presenting your solution today. I think it was really insightful. And I think there's something that's really relevant uh, here for everybody who's listening today. Um, as said, we're going to um, send you all participants a survey afterwards. You can ask questions if needed. We would be happy also to, to set up follow-up discussions or follow-ups if if there's interest here, of course, feel free to reach out to Startup Nation Central and to 27 Pilots if there are any more questions for today. I think we're done here. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for the Startup Nation Central team and my colleagues here from 27 Pilots for organizing this event and make, making it happen. And I think that's all from my side. Have, have a great day, have a good rest of the week, and see you soon.